Greg Howe, S9 Radio. Now I'm going to walk you through the restoration process of the Browning SSB15 sideband only transmitter. And I like to start by taking lots of pictures. Take as many pictures as you think you need, especially of the power supply section here. This is where a lot of the restoration and replacement of the electrolytic capacitors is going to occur. The electrolytic capacitors are known to be a ticking time bomb. If you've got a radio that hasn't been in use for a long time, there's a good chance you're going to pop the fuse, maybe even pop a, a high voltage rectifier or something. So we know these are 45, 50 years old best thing to do is replace them. So take lots of pictures. Then I also like to get down here with a Sharpie pin and also mark the chassis uh, right next to the lug. Reason for this is sometimes you can't see the polarity of the smaller capacitors in these photos. Then we go on to the multi-section capacitor here. These capacitors were specifically made to reduce hum for use in tube sets that employed audio, which obviously this transmitter does. Then we've got another uh, one right here, the smaller one. It's no longer available, so we'll be replacing that with a firecracker style capacitor. Don't skimp out on capacitors. These large multi-section capacitors aren't cheap, but they offer hump suppression, longevity, and surge capacity like no other. Let's get this capacitor out of the way here. And I wanted to show you something else. This is the bias supply capacitor here. This is a two microfarad, 150 volt capacitor. Notice the positive side of that capacitor goes right to this ground lug here. That is the way it's supposed to be. And then we've got the 25 microfarad, 50 volt, low voltage supply capacitors. There's two of them. Go ahead and mark them. Mark the chassis. Same thing here. We've got the positive polarity of another one kind of hidden under here. Both positives go to the same lug uh, that have all the resistors and the uh, positives of the diodes connected for the low voltage supply. So anyways, remember I was telling you capacitors are a ticking time bomb. Well, look at this. Look at that. Here's one that was just getting ready to explode right here. And is now that we've got this out of the way, this is a good time to check your inrush surge resistor. This 4.7 ohm resistor, oftentimes you'll see it's burned, sometimes changed with the wrong value. It's kind of a soft start. It prevents a huge inrush surge when you turn the radio on that detects your rectifier diodes. Now, in the event that you have had a browning that has had a popped fuse because of old capacitors, these rectifier diodes right here should either be replaced or uh, at bare minimum checked. Some of you will have blown rectifiers. They will be burned. They will be charred past recognition. These are the high voltage rectifiers over here. There's four of them. Some Brownings used a rectifier bridge in case of epoxy. These are your low voltage rectifiers for the bias supply over here. Even if your Brownings inrush surge protection resistor doesn't look this bad, I recommend disconnecting one end from the terminal strip and doing a resistance check as these resistors really get a workout and oftentimes don't meet spec. Being a purist, I like to use the original OEM carbon comp type resistors to maintain that original vintage look. However, truth be told, the resistor in the lower half of the picture is a much better component as it's flame proof and also has better temperature stability. Regardless of the type of resistor you choose to use, these surge protection resistors and other power resistors in general create heat. And in some instances, enough heat to melt the solder. So allow yourself some extra lead length to stand the component off the terminal strip or mounting point, and then go ahead and give it a full wrap around the connection, ensuring if they do get hot and do melt the solder, the component will stay in place. When replacing these big multi-section cans, I like to do is get in there with a small pair of pliers and just start twisting the tabs back and forth, and eventually they break off. Um, here's the cap. These caps are old. You're not going to use them again, so just go ahead and twist these tabs off, and uh, you make sure you've got a real good hot soldering iron, and I like to use some liquid flux uh, to improve the flow. Uh, because this is a ground connection here. Even though there's ground connections here, 
you really want this chassis ground. So I've got this whole area of power supply capacitors replaced, the high voltage, uh, the low voltage bias supply. I've got the multi-section CE manufacturing can installed. And now we've got another can type capacitor here, the 10 microfarad, 10 microfarad, 450 volts, which are no longer available. So we're gonna install what is known as a firecrack, or some people call this an M80 type of capacitor. It's the same values. Um, firecracker capacitors were used in some of the earlier Brownings, so they are period correct. And they fit pretty good right up in here. And a little dab of silicone. I don't uh, advise the hot melt glues or anything. They don't hold very good. Okay, I've gone ahead and I've clipped the wires off the 10 microfarad, 10 microfarad can type capacitor here. And you're going to need the entire uh, length of this orange wire to make it over here. I've slid it underneath um, the connections from this IF transformer here. Makes kind of a nice hold down. I don't like zip ties. They're not period correct to this vintage of a radio. And then here's a red wire that was also connected to that 10 microfarad. You can see I've stripped it rather long. The reason for that is now I will have enough wire length to actually twist around the orange wires, twisted together, tinned, um, all ready to be joined together. I've got a small piece of heat shrink on here. This is a high voltage connection, so use some good quality heat shrink. So here's a look at the completed installation of the firecracker capacitor. It's been siliconed in place, uh, taking caution not to get near these mounting holes or the sheet metal screw protruding from the chassis. And here's a close up of the splice. You've got the resistor coming from pin one of V6, that's the 12AX7 microphone preamp tube, and the red wire coming from pin six, going into the splice, and over here to the firecracker capacitor. There's no reason to have this black ground wire uh, length running all over the radio, so I've snipped it off rather short, and it ties right to the ground lug of this tube socket. The next step of the restoration process is going to be the chemical treatment of all the carbon-based controls, the potentiometers. And if you notice, I've got the transmitter positioned so the opening on the potentiometer is in an upward position, allowing the gravity feed down into the control. Now, even if you don't hear noise or static when turning the volume control up and down or have an erratic S meter because of a noisy potentiometer, this chemical treatment of all the potentiometers, which there are three in the SSB-15, is extremely important. The reason for this is moving parts like lubrication. The better carbon-based potentiometers were manufactured with a non-conductive silicon-based lubricant applied. However, after 40, 50, 60 years of component aging, these lubricants can evaporate, they can dry out, they can be contaminated. So a good flushing of the control is important. However, a lot of people get in there with the D5 or a contact cleaner, which is fine as long as you chase it with some sort of a silicon-based lubricant. Think of the workout just the volume control gets, and they're not cheap, and trust me, they do get a lot of wear and tear, and I do replace them quite often, and the main reason for replacement is lack of lubrication. And just a word of caution, try to avoid the use of spray cleaners on switches in tube gear. Many of these switches have high voltage, but the big problem is high voltage and liquids, especially spray cleaners, um, can lead to arcing, especially when you've got this phenolic insulating material. Uh, this material here tends to absorb these spray cleaners. Sooner or later, it migrates out and creates arcing problems. So unless you absolutely have to, Try to stay away from spray cleaners on high voltage switches. And of course, any good restoration is going to involve the service or replacement of the relay. I like to use a 1500 grit, 2000 grit automotive wet, dry sandpaper, just barely, barely brushed across the contacts. So before moving on to the test and alignment procedures, it's best to do a pre-alignment. A pre-alignment involves removing the knobs, ensuring 
that the air variable capacitor behind the VFO or clarifier knob is at half mesh when the VFO knob is at 12 o'clock and checking the clock position of each and every knob. I mean, look at this. We've got the set screw hanging out of this knob. God only knows what position it's supposed to be in. Another benefit of removing all the knobs is you'll be able to give them a cleanse and free them up of all the creepy contaminants uh, these radios have gathered. Even if you've got a virgin, unmolested radio, it's still a good idea to remove the knobs, give them a clean, oil the shafts, and then you can ensure the ride height of the knobs is correct. Unlike this knob, this channel selector knob that was probably jammed up against the front panel during transit, it's up against this painted surface so tight, if I don't remove it and reposition it, it's going to wear a groove into this nice painted surface. Take the knobs off and give the radio a little badly needed TLC. Look at all that gunk on the VFO control. This is what you see when you take the knobs off. So get on there with a little paper towel. Remember I mentioned the control shafts on vintage electronics love to bind up? And it's not just on these Browning CB radios. I see this on high-end vintage stereo volume controls in particular after years of use, abuse, and neglect these shafts oftentimes bind up. Remember that knob that was on crooked with the set screw hanging out? Well, this is that control, the function switch. And even with a pair of pliers, I can barely go from mode to mode on this switch. I like to get a droplet of three-in-one oil where I can strategically place it exactly where needed and then go ahead and work it into the control these control shafts are well known to bind. This one is pretty tough to turn. And like I say, we've got a plastic knob and a set screw that doesn't like to be over tightened. Wow, what a difference. And look at all the gunk that it flushed out. Bunch of black crud flowing out of the shaft. Look at all that gunk. 50 years, maybe 60 years of crud coming off those knobs. So as disgusting as this cleaning fluid looks, I know many of you might be tempted to let these knobs soak overnight. Don't. This is a very primitive plastic that's sensitive to certain types of cleaning agents and chemicals. Not only that, even the mild cleansers, such as Fantastic and 409, will start etching these nice, shiny metal inserts and whatnot within 50 minutes. So limit your exposure to the chemical cleaning agents and make sure and give them a good thorough flushing and drying. So with the exception of the tubes, that completes the restoration and service of the components most likely to fail due to the ill effects of component aging, not just in the SSB-15, but any Browning radio as they're all quite similar in power supply construction and other parts of the radio. Stay tuned for part three where I'll be powering up the SSB-15, talk a little about tubes followed by a precision alignment and then some on-air testing. 73, Greg, S9 Radio. Really?